Hello and welcome to the History Extra podcast from BBC History Magazine, Britain's best-selling history magazine. I'm Ellie Gawthorne. This Saturday, the 9th of November, marks the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall, one of the most pivotal events in modern European history. To mark the occasion, this episode focuses on the history of the wall from its origins in 1961 until its destruction and beyond. Our interview is with the author Ian McGregor, whose new book, Checkpoint Charlie, The Cold War, The Berlin Wall and The Most Dangerous Place on Earth, explores this period through testimonies of those who lived through it. Putting the questions to Ian was our editor, Rob Attar. I'm interested to know how you found the sources for this book, the people you spoke to about the Berlin Wall. Well, there can be a number of ways of going about it. First and foremost, it was to identify who the main players were from an official point of view. So I found out who the the Allied commanders were and went back from there, made contact with them. Uh, so, for instance, uh, Sir Robert Corbett, who was the commandant of British forces in Berlin, I'd made contact with him via finding him on the internet. And we've established a really good relationship now. We've been talking with each other for nearly two years and we're good friends. So, uh, And I've interviewed him several times. From there, what happens normally is you'll be having a very good conversation, very good interview, finding out the facts from their own experience. And then they will say, obviously, as you or I would say to each other if we're talking about something, oh, you should talk to so-and-so. And that leads to another door. You open that door, you talk to that person. Hopefully they'll want to talk to you and uh, reminisce or give anecdotes to verify what that per- the other person has said and so on and so forth. If I was talking to civilians, uh, of which there are many eyewitnesses that I've recorded in the book, Again, that that was detective work. So that was going back to the sources, seeing if there were people that already had been uh, interviewed, whether on radio or TV. Marguerite Asani is one of those, a West Berlin resident who witnessed the death of Peter Fechter, which I talk about in the book in 1961. And she lives in Barnes. And I I saw her on a Cold War documentary and I thought, well, let's see if she's uh, still alive. Uh, And she's in her 80s and she was. Very pleased to see me. We had a very good conversation. So that's how that worked. And then a good source is you contact the organisations themselves. So from an American point of view, I contacted the Berlin US Veterans Association. They've got thousands of members, very well supported and uh, well advertised in the US found them online, contacted them, gave them my credentials. I met up with them and then they were kind enough to invite me to their 75th anniversary of the Berlin Airlift reunion in Berlin, uh, which was about a year ago, one very hot summer's day, and they had an official commemoration. And again, over 300 veterans from the US came to that event. They had an original pilot who was one of the candy bombers in 1948, dropping sweets to the West Berlin kids. He was their guest of honour. To 50-year-olds who were 18-year-old conscripts who were in the US Berlin garrison in 1989 when the wall fell. So there was a, a, a good range. And for a historian and for someone writing a book, that's that's amazing. You've got all these people in situ there. And I was with them for three days and from there met some incredible people. And one of them, uh, Adolf Nashted, who was a uh, Volksdeutsche German, who was born originally in the Bronx. It's a long story, but uh, he moved back to America from Germany after the Second World War, joined up US military intelligence, and his story is incredible. He's got his own chapter in the book. So there's those kind of things. There's, there's many ways of, of, of finding these people, and uh, yeah, I, I spent 18 months finding them. And so when you're writing a book that's predominantly oral history, like this book is, did you already have a plan of how the book was going to turn out, or was it to some extent shaped by the people you spoke to and the things they told you? Uh, Well, both ways, but primarily I wanted it to be chronologically driven, going from obviously pre-Berlin Wall, building up the picture of what uh, the city was like, what Western Eastern Europe was like after the Second World War, so the reader would have an understanding of why the wall in East German eyes was necessary to be built. But then there's no way of of, uh, fully justifying writing blow by blow an account of the Cold War 
in Berlin over a 28, 29 year period. Uh, it would be a huge book and a huge undertaking. What I wanted to do was make it very accessible for the reader to understand various elements that were key to the life of the Berlin Wall and key to why understanding why you could understand why the Berlin Wall fell. So I, I jumped in time through 28 years of history, but finding the right people to tell the right story, whether they were military, east or west, whether they were civilian, east or west, whether they were politicians, east or west, or whether they were journalists, east or west. And you get a, a good 360 degree kind of viewpoint of what life was like in the city. Something you just alluded to is the, the origins of the Berlin Wall. Mm. So I guess for our listeners who may not know exactly why this barrier went up in 1961, what was the backstory to the wall? Well, ultimately, you would argue the backstory is it was to save the East German state, the GDR, from collapsing from the end of the Second World War right up through to uh, the end of the, the Berlin airlift. Those three or four years from 45 to 49, it was a tug of war between East and West. The settlement of Berlin was a thorn in Stalin's flesh, you could say, uh, the communist side of things, because I just think they hadn't envisaged that Berlin would be split in four pieces between the Allies and the Soviets for so long. They probably thought they would be able to take it over as they had, as they did do, uh, taking over the countries of the Eastern Bloc uh, one by one. They thought Berlin would fall too. To have it there in an oasis of communist territory 70 odd miles behind uh, what was the Iron Curtain by 1948 was anathema to them. So because you had these international agreements within Berlin's city itself, you had the, the city was split into four zones. For the, the, the people of uh, Berlin to, to swap from zone to zone was very easy to do. Before the wall, it was easy to go from your home of residence in East Berlin, living under the GDR, to then going into West Berlin for a day's work and then go home again. That, that happened, obviously, every day. Over a million people would do that journey. So as uh, the East Germans under Walter Ulbricht, who, who became head of the GDR in the, the 50s, took over, uh, he's trying to implement the same kind of system they've got under Stalin in Russia. It's a command economy. Everything's about industry, heavy industry. A consumer spending is way down his list of priorities. The democratic right of the people to have their say is way down his list of priorities. So as that went on, more and more people in East Germany are thinking, what life have we got here? We need to get out for the sake of our children, for the sake of just having political free will. They can see West Berlin being rebuilt by the Allies, especially with the money from the Marshall Plan after 1948, whereas East Germany is still looking what it was. It's a, it's a war zone. So bit by bit, if you're growing up, if, if you've survived the war uh, as a teenager, you're now in your 20s, it's the 1950s, you're thinking, what life have I got? I need to get out of here. So tens of thousands of, of East Germans were taking the opportunity to see this open gate if they just stepped over the, the zone from east to west and they can escape. And it's, it's telling to see by the time the Berlin Wall was about to be built, it was over something like over a million East Germans had fled the, the GDR, well over a million. Uh, and of those, 50% were under 25. So you could tell the best uh, brains of the country uh, wanted to get out of the place. Ulbricht, uh, the GDR regime, could see this. They knew that eventually the country would bleed to death from an economic point of view. They didn't have the, uh, the the population to actually drive whatever plans they had for the economy, for society in general. So I think it was obvious that something had to be done. Both sides could see that it was teetering on the brink. Uh, by 1961, Ulbricht was putting so much pressure on Nikita Khrushchev, uh, the head of the, the Soviet Union, uh, his de facto boss, that if we don't do something something soon, the country is going to collapse either economically or socially. We have to try something. Uh, and rather, obviously, than start a war, they thought they could... They, they'd call the bluff of uh, the Allies. They knew they had a young American president, John F. Kennedy, had just got in in 1960. Could they perhaps build something? Could they build this barrier that the press were thinking might happen? And Ulbricht had famously denied, we have no intention of building a wall in 1961. And that's exactly what they did. And actually building the wall must have been quite an undertaking because they, they had to do it, most of it, in one night, didn't they? Because they couldn't really do it in the daytime when everyone was walking about. So 
How on earth did they build this huge barrier in just a few hours? Well, it was, uh, yeah, I mean, it was a barrier uh, that, that they built, but it was a more a barbed wire barrier that they built straight away. It, it was just literally to stop people crossing into the zones. The wall would come later, uh, a few days, a few days, few weeks later. But uh, yeah, I mean, they purposely chose August the 13th, Sunday, not a bank holiday or anything like that, but it is uh, to Berliners on a hot summer's day. Uh, on a Sunday, they, they thought, let's all just relax, uh, get out to the lakes, that kind of thing uh, on East and West. But that was a, a key weekend. They just thought, Everyone's going to be relaxed. No one's going to be expecting this. Ulbricht and uh, Eric Honecker, who was given the task of, of planning, it was called Operation Rose. He was tasked with the secret plan, I suppose, to uh, put this into place. They'd stored all the materials they needed around the city, tons and tons of barbed wire, poles, uh, telegraph poles, anything they get their hands on. It's, it's quite... Uh, one thing I discovered when I was doing the research was... A lot of the buildings that they planned to do in East Berlin in the next few years, a lot of the materials were actually purloined to actually build the barrier. And that's why a lot of people were seeing or commentating on, I should say, how war-torn the sector still looked well into the 60s. That was because uh, they'd used all the materials to build the war. So, yes, they... Uh, Immediately, they were just using jackhammers to drill up the roads, uh, put in the poles to then string up the barbed wire. It was literally like putting your toe in the water to see what the Allied response would be. They had no intention of uh, building this barrier either on the exact zonal markings of the east and west line or obviously going into the west sector. They built it uh, quite a few yards back in their own sector. So they were well within their what they thought their sovereign right to build this barrier. The, the guards who were looking after the thousands of workers building the barrier, they, they had their backs to the Americans and the British and the French. They were looking at their own population to make sure no one was going to disturb them. So that, that's, uh, the day was purposely chosen because no one was going to be at work. No one was trying to get across the borders. They, uh, they were expecting resistance, but they knew it would, be, it would be less than if they'd done it on a work day. So what was the reaction of Berliners on, on both sides to this wall suddenly, or this barrier suddenly appearing? Probably the same as we would be if someone did it in London. Incredulity, uh, shock, then led to anger, frustration, very much a lot of frustration because they could see that they were powerless to stop it. If you're looking at uh, thousands of workers surrounded by thousands of guards on the eastern side building this barrier, you're purposely, physically, aggressively being kept away from both sides. Uh, to, to investigating what's going on. And then if you're on the Western side and you're watching your West Berlin police force, as well as uh, your allied protective shield of American, French and British shoulders, just monitoring what's going on. No one was actively doing anything to prevent this because they couldn't. They couldn't enter Soviet soil to actually uh, prevent this, nor would they. That's what built up. So obviously, especially by the main sites at the Brandenburg Gate, for instance, huge crowds built up. The West Berlin police had to come out in force to keep them back. They didn't want any uh, shooting incidents, for instance. Uh, water cannon was used. So there, there, was a, there was a lot of anger and frustration, which I record in the book from the eyewitnesses that were there. And so you, you talked about how on the Western side there were no attempts to intervene militarily or anything. But what was the reaction at the highest level to the Berlin Wall appearing, say, on the American side, the British side, the German side? I've, I've said in the book in those first few pages where I say that there was information, if you wanted to stitch together what might have gone on or what might the East Germans be planning or the Soviets be planning, I should say, sorry, there was information coming in in dribs and drabs from various sources, whether they were Allied intelligence or whether they were uh, East Berliners, East Germans coming through that were either coming to work or whether they were actually refugees themselves that were that had made it through the crossings and were now in the various Allied centres, uh, the transit camps before they, they were processed. Each of them were saying in, in that August they could see piles of equipment building up or they could see hundreds of trucks inside roads or they could see a uh, build-up of troops or police forces. This was all coming through, but no one thought to think they would do something on such a huge scale where they're literally going to seal off a whole city. The Allied commandants thought, yep, there, there could be something brewing. There were communiques going back and forward to the various embassies, communiques going back to Washington too in London, that something's going to go, something's going to happen. But 
they never expected that. No one, I don't think anyone expected that. That's why everyone was caught so much on the hop. Uh, even on, you know, days afterwards, they were still, everyone was still in the dark. What would happen? And from quite early on, almost straight away, in fact, there were several typically East Berliners trying to escape, get over the wall. How much risk were these people taking trying to get back to West Berlin? Well, the, the, one of the first instances was a, a young, uh, is a tailor, uh, Lithkin his name was, and uh, he was uh, shot while trying to swim one of the canals. The barriers went up, but it was more, you know, the, the actual uh, border guards that were stopping the people getting through the main transit camps, because I've said it was 81 crossing points before the barriers went up. These have now been reduced down to 13. So you're, you're literally sieving people through, you're, 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 you're funneling them through, I should say, sorry. Uh, where they can get access to get out. So you can try, you can try and get through these bar- huge barriers that they erected, that vicious razor wire, that kind of thing. There's a famous scene of the young uh, female East German running to her boyfriend who's made a gap in the fence for her and she catches her forehead quite violently on the, on the, the top that she wasn't expecting. But uh, it was within, you know, hours that the first person was shot and it was within days that people started being killed that's when people knew it was serious that's when people thought actually they really are gonna kill people if we try and 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 get through the barriers and we're sealed in it it, it's a natural thing the process was so slow we they didn't have 24-hour news cycle that we do if you've got the east german media completely in lockdown they're not going to say anything they're not going to announce what's going on the government might give leaflets to to the populace which they were doing saying we're doing this for your own safety this this is now an anti-fascist barrier to stop enemy agents coming in that kind of news i suppose but uh and in the west they were just trying to find out the story they were sending their reporters to the to the barriers to find out what was going on there was once the barriers were up there was there wasn't much getting around that we couldn't get over there to find out what was going on and, and these berliners were now trapped your book is actually got the title of checkpoint charlie which i'm sure is a name that will resonate with a lot of listeners This wasn't the only checkpoint in Berlin. So why is this the one that got such a famous name and the one that we all think about? Well, I I suppose Checkpoint Charlie's gone down in history since uh, the Berlin Wall went up because that that was where, for some, it was the epicentre of where East and West faced off with soldiers with loaded weapons eyeing each other up across uh, no man's land, so to speak. And... That was the main place where internationally, you or I, you know, foreigners were allowed to go through, diplomats were allowed to go through. It all went on there. There were other crossing points, obviously, like I said, there were now 13 crossing points. The majority of them were for civilians from the, within the city. So if you were an East Berliner, you'd cross over at other points. West Berlin would do the same. West Germans would do the same. That Everyone had their own point of, of, that they could cross at, that they were allowed to, whereas Checkpoint Charlie was purely almost like an international crossing point. And uh, a lot of people saw it as a a pressure valve to gauge what was going on. So in the early days when the barrier went up, that's where a lot of uh, tension was mounting. So for instance, the first big military standoff in October, so only a few months after the the barriers had gone up, that's where the the famous tank standoff happened, where an American diplomat uh, was taking his wife to the theatre uh, in East Berlin because they, they they often went there. They never had a problem going there. And that's where the East Germans were decided we shall up the ante and see if we can stop the Allies thinking they can just cross when they want without showing a pass. Because at that time, if you wore a uniform, you had diplomatic plates, you crossed over. No one checked your, your credentials. And that's what happened. They, he was asked, he refused. The Allies and, and the Soviets and these Germans decided this was the standpoint that they were going to have a face-off to the point where you've now got a dozen American tanks and a dozen Russian tanks locked and loaded, pointing at each other. The international press all come down and, and watch what's going to happen. It was like high noon. And it took phone calls through the back channels between Kennedy's White House and Khrushchev in the Kremlin to actually make them back down. But at the time, air forces were put on standby, armies were put on standby, the world was watching. And that's where I think Checkpoint Charlie probably found its, itself forever in the history books. So, so in West Berlin, you'd have had, there were British, uh, American and French soldiers there, still as a legacy of the end of World War II. What was it like for, for them now, and essentially cut off from the West in just this small half of the city? Obviously, there was 
travel routes. There was there was the air corridors going through into West Berlin. There was uh, the train corridors, and then, then there was what, the the autobahn route. The Russians, after after the the Berlin blockade failed, they weren't going to touch those routes any further. There, there, there might be the odd uh, occasion, well, it happened frequently, where they would be intransigent at the border controls and hold people up, hold a train up, hold cars going through, or or buzz the odd aeroplane going through. But generally. I talked to dozens of American, British troops that were stationed there throughout the life of the Berlin Wall. I talked to uh, a few French uh, gendarmes who were on duty at Checkpoint Charlie. To a man and woman, all of them said, no matter no matter what year they, they served there, all of them said it was the best uh, tour of duty they ever had. And, and most of them were career soldiers uh, or career policemen. And uh, they might have been in the army for 25, 30 years, but all of them just kind of gleamed over with uh, nostalgic eyes and, and just loved the tour of duty that they had. Still to come on the History Extra podcast. He sat in the middle with his translator and he just assured them to say, these are amazing events going on this evening. We all don't know what's going on. All I can assure you is, while I'm in charge of the British sector, nothing's going to happen to you. So once the wall went up, it was in operation for nearly 30 years. How far did the two halves of the city then diverge in terms of what it was like to live in them? The west, western half of Berlin carried on doing what it had been doing all the way through from the end of the war through to when the Berlin Wall went up. Uh, reconstruction, millions and millions of uh, dollars pouring in, uh, mainly from obviously the American side of things, just rebuilding the city to where it was like every other uh, Western European city you could go into. I would say that the difference on the Western side was it was an international city. So it was probably the most international city in Western Europe because of the amount of military and civil personnel you had to have to service the the, the garrisons that were there. So I would imagine that uh, as, we, as we see when we watch, you know, a Harry Palmer movie or something like that, it's it was an exciting place to be. You You, you could literally be... I don't know, two, three hundred yards away from a wall down, down the side street, you wouldn't even know the wall was there. Uh, and many of the veterans that I talked to said that, you know, as, if you weren't on duty at the wall and you're living in West Berlin, you wouldn't think you're 70 miles inside Soviet territory. It just wouldn't occur to you. Whereas obviously on the eastern sector, yeah, I mean, you could see it all the way up until 89 when the wall went and people were finally crisscrossing and going into the eastern half of the city, it was still as if you'd gone back in time. You could be a Russian soldier about to plant your red flag on the Reichstag building. Lots of buildings bombed out, lots of buildings destroyed completely, some rubble in some side streets, uh, bullet holes marking the walls. It was very much the the main thoroughfares of East Berlin were deliberately, obviously, uh, from a showcase point of view, reconstructed along very Soviet lines, very, you know, ugly buildings, uh, most of which got knocked down after uh, reunification. But you go down the side streets and you'd still be back in 1945. Over the 28 years of, of the Berlin Wall's existence, were there any particularly important flashpoints other than those that occurred shortly afterwards after the wall was constructed that you've already talked about? I mentioned uh, the, the death of Peter Fechter. And that was one of the the early killings. There, there, there had been people shot and killed already before him, but his death really brought worldwide condemnation on uh, not just the, the East German regime, but the just what, what the, the Soviet regime stood for too. So he was a boy who was, he was, you know, a teenager and uh, just a, a manual labourer. And I call the... Uh, the, the chapter where I talk about him, I, 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 the chapter's called Elvis is Dead. Big rockabilly Elvis fan. He had the, the quiffed hair, wanted to have the jeans, the plimsolls, the, the bomber jacket, everything. And he was just with a bunch of friends who decided we've had enough of the life we've got uh, in East Berlin. We're going to try our luck and see if we can get over. It was nearly, it was, you know, the first anniversary of uh, the wall going up. So obviously there was a lot of tension in the city still. Him and a friend tried to... Uh, to get across near Checkpoint Charlie, which is why I included him in the story. 
his friends managed to get over. And by then, obviously, it was a wall. They, they, they built a proper wall, like a dozen feet high, topped with barbed wire. Uh, and there was a, a proper killing zone to, to navigate before he even got to the wall. And he was just unfortunate. His friend dashed first, at the, went ahead first, dodged the bullets that were firing at them. There was over 30 shots fired at them in total. He got over. As uh, Peter was getting to the final hurdle to get up there, and hopefully his friend would try and pull him up. That's when he, he was hit three times. And what, and what shocked the world was, it wasn't the fact that he'd been shot. It was the fact that he was l- allowed to just lie there bleeding to death in front of everybody. So the watching Americans, the military police witnessed it all. They weren't going to get involved because they couldn't go on to East German territory. It might cause some kind of diplomatic incident. So they didn't know what to do. The East Germans were waiting for orders. They shot him and he was lying there. Now they decided, well, what should we do? They they were waiting for their orders too. But meanwhile, hundreds of West Berliners had seen what had happened and were coming out to find out what was going on. Because for the first hour while this kid was lying on the ground, bleeding to death, he was screaming for help, screaming in pain, but no one would come to him. So gradually, obviously... He's, he's losing his strength. And it, it was like a horror show. By this time, the media had turned up and they captured it all. So the famous photos you have are of his, uh, his body lying on the ground before these Germans managed to get him. By the time they decided to, they could go out and they'd waited for a doctor to turn up, a few hours had gone by, he was, he was obviously going to die. Uh, they managed to capture him. You see the, the look that's captured on the photographs of the faces of the, the East German border guards who'd shot him is, is one of fear and tension because they, by this time, hundreds of West Berliners are screaming and shouting at them. They took him away, but he, he, he died. He died a few hours later. That brought so much international attention to what was going on. And it really focused, again, it focused Checkpoint Charlie in the world's eyes that this is somewhere that you know, is, is a very, very dangerous place. People are dying. Young kids are dying for no reason. Now, another popular conception people would have of Berlin at this time is it being just full of spies, essentially. How far is that true? Yes, it was. I mean, especially when you, you watch the Tom Hanks film, Bridge of Spies. I mean, that continued all the time. Obviously, both the Allies and uh, the Communists used the, the Glinicki Bridge, which was further north of Checkpoint Charlie. That was the main bridge that was used to obviously swap spies. Famously, that's where those, those kind of things happened. With Checkpoint Charlie, officially, that's where we stared off and, and looked at each other. But whereas uh, what I wanted to try and get in the book too was where we talk about what our military intelligence services did in the city itself rather than just Checkpoint Charlie. So these guys like Bricksmith, uh, which was part of our agreement with uh, the Soviets once uh, the end of the war had come. So the Soviets, the French, the Americans were allowed to obviously venture into each other's territory to keep tabs on what the other was doing. And I think that was, it was a good idea because in a way, each was recognising there was a potential for a flashpoint if each other didn't know within reason what the other was was doing in terms of what forces were there, what military hardware each of them had within uh, the city or within the boundaries of the city. So what I talk about in the book is British forces of Bricksmiths who were military intelligence who were allowed to obviously go in their cars and play cat and mouse with the East Germans and the Soviets venturing around East Germany, around East Berlin, to find out what the Soviets and the East German armed forces were doing, uh, how that affected what the Warsaw Pact ultimately might be doing over the, the life of the, of the Berlin Wall. So uh, it was a very cat and mouse game. The, some of the stories I capture are these guys in uh, zooped up cars, whether they're Opals or Range Rovers or something like that, reinforced chassis so they wouldn't be crushed if they got into a crash with a, an East German or Soviet vehicle that was chasing them roaming around at night, just trying to keep tabs on finding out which armoured brigade of, of the Soviet army was was moving into a certain area of East Germany or which new mid-range missile system they might be moving in in the 1960s or 70s that we didn't know about. And the Soviets did the same to us, but, it, you know, people were 
their lives were in danger, and I capture that in the book. I mean, one American soldier was shot and killed doing that, trying to spy on a Soviet camp. Uh, a couple of the, the the British guys that I interviewed, one of them was almost assassinated by a Stasi hit squad who tried to ram him off the road deliberately in a five-ton truck, and he just survived. To get back to your question, yeah, I mean, it, the Allies would have been foolish not to use West Berlin as a jump-off point to find out what was going on. But saying that, the Stasi were one of the most successful and sophisticated sophisticated spying operations in the whole of the Cold War. To try and get spies embedded in East Germany and successfully have them laying back information for us, I I wasn't told that by any of the people I interviewed. I asked that question and they were saying, well, it would have been uniquely amazing to find people who could get that for us because we were up against such an impregnable and impressive force. Coming on to Checkpoint Charlie again, what kind of an actual place was it like? I write to say that it was very different depending on which side of the line you were on. Well, yeah, I mean, the the uh, on the West, we never we never recognised the sovereignty of uh, the East German state for for decades, and we never uh, recognised their right to stop diplomats or military personnel or whatever going through into East Berlin because that hadn't been the agreement from the end of the Second World War onwards. So the Allies deliberately had a very small, insignificant hut at our checkpoint that led into East Berlin. It was always the same. It was manned by a few staff. It was kept very simple. Obviously, the streets that surrounded it on Friedrichstrasse, where it was, they were rebuilt within reason. So the city was still growing around it, which hadn't changed much as as of today. It still looks the same when you walk down it. Whereas on the other side, what was derelict no man's land was obviously improved over the years, but only slightly. I mean, you know, they tarmac the road properly and they clean up the debris and the rubble and everything else, and that was clean. But then when you ventured over into uh, the East German side, it was chalk and cheese. It was a very, very sophisticated system of uh, roadways that funneled through chicanes, alarm systems, the wall by then. If you talk about, say, for instance, by the mid-70s, the anti-fascist barrier, as it were, was at its most sophisticated and deadly. So, it was, And that's why it was called the Death Strip. So as I say in the book, there's a very good drawing in the book that shows you just how impregnable it was. I mean, there was layers of uh, barbed wire on the East German side. There was the original wall that they'd set up that you had to get over. Then you had to get through the death strip itself, which had all various trip wires, dog runs. They had automatic machine gun trip wires at one point, which they then, because of international outcry, they had to get rid of. And then you got to the, the, the new wall, the Grenz wall, as they call it, which was pretty much impregnable. And that's the kind of wall, as I was a teenager growing up, that I remember the most thinking it's as impregnable as the Himalayas. I can't imagine anyone getting over that. It was like the Hunger Games made real. You just were never going to get over that. If you if you got over it, you were a very, very, very lucky, fortunate person. It's like winning the lottery. I mean, 10,000 people tried to get over, under, or fly over, or smash through the Berlin Wall. Not many did it. In 1989, famously, the Berlin Wall came down. How much of a shock was that to people? I mean, did anyone expect this or did this really come out of the blue? I would say to the watching world, you or I watching it on TV. So I was a university student. I was almost finishing my degree. Yeah, you you watch it on TV and your mouth drops open and you're, you're thinking... I can't believe it. It's, I can't believe it's happened because it happened so quickly. But I think judging by a lot of the, the people that I interviewed that were there at the time, uh, depending on obviously what role they played, and that, that was a surprising thing to me. Uh, some of the senior people that I talked to, so Major General Robert Corbett, who was the British commander, he said he, he joined the garrison. He'd, he'd only been in the garrison uh, leading it for a few months when, you know, the, the wall's about to come down. And, and uh, he'd said himself to me, and I capture that in the book, is he spoke fluent German, spoke fluent French, uh, and he's a very, uh, he's a people person. He loves talking to people. And he made it one of his missions while he was there in charge that he wanted to understand the psyche of the East Germans. And he wanted to know what was going on. He wanted to know how they felt. Because he could see what was building up. Because obviously, again, hindsight's a great thing, but you you look at what was going on in the Eastern Bloc for that whole year, especially through the summer that was where 
the freedom of travel is what was the main sticking point for for East Germans. That is what they wanted. The, the government uh, wouldn't let them. They they could only go on holiday to various nearby places like Czechoslovakia or Poland, or if they were lucky, they'd get to the Soviet Union or Cuba. But not many of them did. Mainly, it, it was you can only go to Czechoslovakia. That's that's where you're going to go. So gradually. As the system was failing and more and more East Germans were just getting up and going in the summer of 89, you could obviously tell something was going on. And this is a myth, obviously. Mikhail Gorbachev had come to power in the Soviet Union a few years before. He was having a rapprochement with the West. He was obviously talking to Reagan about disarmament or a lowering of the tension uh, between America and the USSR. And East Germany was was a, a bit part of that that big theatre of international relations. So the more he was introducing Perestroika and Glasnost, Honecker, who was now g- governing East Germany, could see, maybe he saw the writing on the wall, but he was seeing that Gorbachev was no friend to the East Germans. He was very much of, the system stays the same, there's nothing wrong with the system, we will keep doing what we're doing. But he wasn't listening to his younger generation. He wasn't listening, certainly, to Gorbachev. So all the signs were there. The the population was making its own decision with its feet. So that that was probably... There were signals, but no one realised it was just going to end as it did in in hours, in November. And it almost ended kind of almost by accident, essentially. Well, it did. That was the thing, the infamous uh, press conference by Gunter Schabowski, who was the, the press spokesman that they'd installed during those few weeks that were crucial, where they just, you know, weeks before, the, the younger generation, that were still committed communists, but the younger generation in uh, the East German Politburo that, that had deposed Honecker, and they decided that to hold on to power, they needed to show some kind of democratic signal to the population. So they were saying, OK, we'll have these these democratic press conferences that they love in the West. We'll get the international press in and we'll be telling them all these policies that gradually we'll bring in to keep the population happy and, and in a hope that they would stay in power. And that's where it went wrong for them. Uh, Gunter Schabowski turned up. Uh, he was a party loyalist. He'd been given a, a brief that he hadn't checked properly that was talking about freedom of travel and how they would gradually, and I emphasise the word gradually, bring this in. Whether it was a, a, a miscommunication from him in translation to an international press or whether it was, like I'd said, he just hadn't read his brief properly, he announced forthwith that East Germans would be able to go through the checkpoints unmolested as long as their permits were in order. But then when someone asked him, and when does this come into effect, he said, well, immediately. The gun was started, basically. And if you're an East German listening to this or watching it on TV and you've had years of no freedom to travel, and someone in the party, in the government's just said, you're free to cross the border immediately. That's what happened. And it caught everyone with their pants down. Was there any danger that this could have ended in violence? I mean, how, yes. obviously it was peaceful, as we know, but how close was it to the East Germans or even the Soviets getting involved militarily? There's, well, that was the key thing. The, the reason why I would say that there wasn't any bloodshed, because obviously... Tiananmen Square had been that year, and that had been a bloodbath in China, where the party had had severely cracked down using their armed forces on a civilian population that was calling for change. The same had happened through those summer months that I just talked about in East Germany, and the authorities had deliberately pulled away from using their massed uh, police and armed forces from driving the people off the streets. And the same happened with the wall. I mean, from from an East German perspective... They were surprised that the Soviets stayed in barracks. Gorbachev had told the Soviet command in East Germany, and you've got to think, they had 300,000 troops and thousands of tanks, airplanes, everything in East Germany. They could have easily crushed it. They could have easily stopped it. They remained in barracks. They didn't go anywhere. They were told to. The East Germans were on their own. So obviously the speed of the opening of the war caught them by surprise. But the main thing, which I talk about in the book, interviewing some of the East Germans, is the regime froze. So uh, you've got your commanders on the ground at the checkpoints, at the main checkpoints. So like I said, checkpoint Charlie and Bahamastrasse, which was a key one as well, is uh, commanders were left to their own devices. They were given no orders. They were given no clarification, even though they were demanding it. Every second as they're watching the crowds, thousands of East Germans are building up there, waiting, wanting to get across. On the other side, they can see that there's a a buildup of crowds, West Germans, 
wanting them to come across. What do they do? Do they issue their troops with orders to shoot to kill, drive the crowds off, use tear gas, without commands from their superiors? And this is, you've got to remember, this this is a, a society that has been governed with, you don't make any decision without someone else giving you the order to do so. So they, they weren't going to do that. Uh, so from that side of things, I think the Soviets made sure that nothing was going to happen that side. From the Western side, a lovely story that I tell is, again, getting back to uh, Major General Corbett, he potentially stopped shootings, potentially stopped a bloodbath at the Brandenburg Gate section the night the war was opening. A very small story from that is uh, the Soviets were always allowed to have a garrison by the Soviet War Memorial, which is actually inside the British sector. And they were allowed, uh, usually a platoon of soldiers were allowed to stay there. Because when you think about it, you know, it commemorated the 80,000 or so Russian soldiers that died capturing Berlin in 45. So to them, that's sacrosanct, that's Russian soil. So they were always allowed to have troops there 24 hours a day. But what happens when the borders are opening and the crowds are building, the West German youth are there swearing, throwing things at these Russian soldiers that are behind their perimeter... They were locked and loaded, thinking, what are we going to do? Are we going to have to fight our way out of this? Uh, Are we going to have to shoot people that are coming over the barrier trying to get at us? Because they didn't know what was going on. No one had told them. So uh, Major General Corbett, this is a a man who's flying around the the British sector, trying uh, himself to find out what's going on. He gets a call to get to the, the Brandenburg Gate because they're worried that there's going to be shootings. He takes a translator. He talks to the officer, Soviet officer in charge. And he handled it supremely well. He he got them all in a, in the main assembly room. He asked the, the Soviet officer to get his whole command to stand around him. He sat in the middle with his translator and he just assured them to say, these are amazing events going on this evening. We all don't know what's going on. All I can assure you is while I'm in charge of the British sector, nothing's going to happen to you. And he could instantly feel the tension lowering. Uh, and as he's leaving the Soviet garrison, they, they all stand to attention and give him an honour guard. And one of the nicest stories from that is he told me when I went to see him, he lives down in Devon, and, and, he, t- and he, he showed me in his study uh, that whole cupboard full of Russian presents. And he said that every year he gets some kind of, of uh, memento sent to him by the Russian military. It could be a, a, a Russian officer's hat, could be really nice vodka, could be Russian badges. But every year they send him something because they, they thanked him for what he did that night. So individuals had huge responsibility on their shoulders here because if this had become a violent event, you know, global history could have been different. Yeah, well, there definitely could have been shootings, definitely. I think that's... Uh, when you think about how the, the population of West Berlin flocked to the wall, and, they, they, you know, as they, they could do anyway. I mean, that's, that's why, obviously, the western side of the wall is covered in fa- its famous graffiti and paintings and slogans. They could go there. But this time, rather than just stand by the wall, they're allowed to stand on the wall. And that's where you've got those iconic scenes of thousands of people by the Brandenburg Gate just standing there, looking down on, on the, the East German border guards. So, yes, I mean... There were elements, there were, there were reactionary elements, hardliners within the East German police force, within the East German military, that, w- again, were planning, actively talking to, to one another for those first two or three days of how they were going to reassert their authority. And maybe you could say it's, uh, it's the only credit that can be given to, to those leaders that were in charge, like Krenzer, Egon Krenzer, who was, who'd taken over from Honecker that they paved the way for that kind of thing not to happen, for a brutal reaction not to happen, because it was, it was, uh, it could have, yeah, it could have easily happened. You'd seen it with Tiananmen Square, you'd seen it in Poland, the Gdansk shipyards uh, a year earlier, you'd seen it at the Baltic states. The logical reaction was always vicious. And in, in East Germany, the guards just stood there and watched what was going to go on. We're talking now 30 years ago. It wasn't long before uh, Berlin... Germany was was unified a few months later, but to what extent did the Berlin Wall remain in people's psyches afterwards? I think the older generation it it it, it burns in their psyche uh, because they grew up with it. All all the, I mean, obviously with a book like I've written, I'm talking to people that they're in their fifties, sixties, and seventies. If they grew up in Berlin during the life of the war, whether they served on it or lived by it or escaped through it, all of them 
east and west, it's it's a scar. It's a scar in their consciousness. Uh, they don't have good memories of it. There was one or two East Germans uh, that I interviewed that obviously reflect maybe what's going on right now. It, they have this nostalgic view of the fact that it kept their their lifestyle, their their system of government safe to what they thought was a good thing, as in they had free healthcare, they had free state education, all the way up to university level, job for life, et cetera, et cetera. And they, they you know, there was one guy I, I interviewed, uh, Peter Bochman, who was a major, I, I, he rose to be a major, he was, he's a, he was a border guard officer, and he'd served at Checkpoint Charlie as well. And he now lives in a, a very nice, I have to say, council flat in northeast Berlin, where a lot of the old East Berlin border guards live. They've got a nice little community there. And I interviewed him, and, and uh, going into his house was very, it was like going back in time. It was like the Channel 4 series, series Deutschland. It was amazing. And he was honest. He, he, he was saying there was lots of things wrong with the system, but but when you pressed him, he was very keen to say that they they did the best job possible. Uh, he was proud of his service. Uh, and he felt quite bitter about his lot now, where he's he's got a very basic state pension, despite the years of service he gave to, to East Germany. Uh, him and his comrades are looked upon as pariahs. And he wished it was, you know, maybe it could be back to where, the way it was. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that that rang true with several people that I talked to. But obviously most of them... They just thought the thing was was evil, which it was. What is there now left of the Berlin Wall and Checkpoint Charlie? Well, Checkpoint Charlie is it's a tourist attraction. That's the, the best thing I can say about it. It's not that impressive. The, I have to say the museum that's right by it, the Checkpoint Charlie Museum, which is which has been there since since it's created. Well, early sixties, it's been there, and uh, that was almost like a. Uh, it started out as almost a pressure group. It was keeping the it was keeping the plight of of West Berliners alive as to what was going on, and and they they recorded and commemorated all the people that were killed trying to cross the wall as well. And that, that is that is a good museum. Checkpoint Charlie itself is is literally, to my mind anyway, when I've been there dozens of times, it's 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 very much as if you'd you'd get your photograph taken if you were outside the guard box at Buckingham Palace. I mean that that's the vibe I had when I was there. You have reenactors dressed in in American uniform. They're very happy to you obviously pay them to get your photograph taken. Uh, it's a replica of the box, the guard box that was there from uh, the fifties onwards. Just a, a, an ironic anecdote I'll give you. One time I was there, I was researching the story of Peter Fechter and his death. And you literally walk 150 yards to your left down Zimmerstrasse from Friedrichstrasse. And that's the point where Peter Fechter bled to death, was shot and bled to death. And there's a very uh, iconic uh, moving monument to him, quite a small one. I mean, blink and you'd, you'd walk past it. But if you know it's there, you'll go there. I, I've, I've visited it a few times and there's always some flowers there. But I went up to uh, Checkpoint Charlie after I'd been to Peter Fechter's memorial. And I, uh, I, I spoke to the guy and just said hello. And I said to him, what do you think of the, the Peter Fechter memorial? Have you visited it? And he didn't know what I was talking about. So, and I had to literally point down the road and say, well, it's just down there on your right-hand side. And he didn't know who he was, didn't know what had happened and, uh, and why it was such a big thing. And at the end of the day, he said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm just, just earning my money standing here getting my photo taken. So there's that kind of thing. And I, I, obviously you can't really judge them, but it does bring home to you that it's a tourist attraction. That was Ian McGregor. Checkpoint Charlie, The Cold War, The Berlin Wall and The Most Dangerous Place on Earth – has just been published by Constable. And you can read more about the fall of the wall in issue 19 of BBC World Histories, which is on sale now, as well as at our website, historyextra.com. Thanks for listening. Today's podcast was produced by Ben Hewitt and Jack Bateman. We'll be back on Monday when I'll be speaking to Roland Emmerich, director of the new film, Midway. Midway.